going price and yield move conversely, okay? <laughs> the price rose and the yield fell. Uh, going along uh, for this ride, read the carry trade, have been major U.S. banks. So it turns out that the risk takers are not just the hedge funds and the I-banks any longer, but it's also the commercial banks, which I find to be tremendously amazing. But basically, if you count one and one and come to the inclusion of two, and you know that the Fed is going to buy $1.25 trillion of an asset, you better buy some of it before the Fed buys it, and you go along for the ride. And they did it on a leverage basis. Now, <clears throat> what has happened in 2009 is the market has financial, the pricing of financial instruments has completely, to, the basis has completely and totally changed. The amount of money uh, being put forth, and then the amount is in the next article by um, Mother of All Carry Trades Face an Inevitable Bust, and this is by uh, Rubini, a uh, professor out of NYU. Uh, I think he put the number about $800 billion in 09, at least by November 09, that got committed from the riskless institutions and got loaned on a very favorable basis, on an overnight basis, to the risk takers. The risk takers took the money. And what they did is they're living, on the mar they're living on the difference of the interest rate on an overnight basis. Both sides can evaluate whether they think the risk the next day is going to be terrible and change the terms. The main way in which the terms change is not by the interest rate, but the most important and interesting part of this whole thing is that the reflection of risk, as both sides view it, is in something called the repo margin, which is the previous page. It's very hard to come by these numbers. This is the average repo haircut on structured debt. The haircut is, is the down payment. How much of a down payment do you need? And basically, what you see is why we have asset bubbles in world markets and why prices have detached from fundamental underlying value. Because look at the dates. This is starting uh, January 12, 07 which is in the, heat, the, the peak of the, the bubble, of the, of the 07 bubble, the haircut was essentially zero. Namely, nothing down. <laughs> Basically, the amount of leverage you had was infinity, <laughs> as much as you want. You didn't, have to come, you didn't need a dollar of capital to borrow as much as you want on that overnight basis. I think, and in, in, in I've, I've looked and been able to find some of those down payments, and it got to, I think, only 2% by less than investment grade paper. Only 2%. But anything that was investment grade, you could get with zero down. You could borrow infinity if you were a member of the club. And then I'll have to tell you who's making the market, and, and, and which explains a lot of other things. Now, when the market starts to fall apart, and this is uh, 07. If you remember from the summer series, I dated the time in which the financial markets fell apart. The, the residential mortgage-backed market, security market, stopped dead cold in its tracks August 3rd, 07. And so what you start to see is these people were not very far ahead in anticipating this because they didn't start raising the, the repo margin until September. And they raised it essentially from zero in steps up until October, November of 08, up to about 48%. So if you're a hedge fund and you're borrowing at, let's say, 2% down, and your capital, let's say if you're borrowing with 2% down, and they lend you 98 cents to buy a security, basically the leverage you get is 49 to 1. And that's where those high leverages of the hedge funds existed when the, the music stopped in the financial markets. If you're leveraged 49 to 1 and suddenly the market goes against you, uh, then suddenly you're wiped out very quickly. Um, now the what then happened, look at the steps. You go from almost infinite leverage to two to one. Now, what that means is the risky en entities who could, you know, on capital of $100 could borrow millions. Now, uh, on $100 of capital, you can only borrow $200. You can only buy $200 worth of securities, rather. Okay, so but in other words, you use your, your $100 plus their $100. So basically, you go from infinite pyramiding down to only two to one. Now, basically, what that means is the balance sheet of the risk takers had to shrink. When the balance sheet of the risk takers had to shrink, they had to sell assets. And that's where we got into the financial meltdown of, of 08. Uh, across the board, all asset classes, virtually all asset classes, fell, except the US Treasury as the flight to quality asset. 
So basically we had, and that's why it happened. The reason that the financial meltdown occurred so, so severely is they went from infinite leverage to two to one leverage. And then basically you have to shrink your balance sheet from a very large multiple of your capital just down to two to one. And, and you have to shed assets in all directions and you shed every kind of asset. And that's where you get into something called contagion. And there is no good asset. Actually, the only good asset in that environment ended up being what was the system decided was the flight to quality asset in a systemic meltdown, which was still the treasury. Um, so basically, this, this explains the leverage that occurred, and it explains the deleveraging and the financial meltdown that took place. Now, this, these numbers were given to me uh, a few months ago. And I asked, and by the way, question, who makes this market? This market is made by the investment bankers. They, they talk to their clients who are um, like the endowment funds. They say, do you, do you want to do a, a collateralized loan? And then they find the hedge funds who do want to do the collateralized loan. So the middleman are the investment bankers. I'm not sure what they charge for that transaction, but the point of all that is it's a private market. It does not, these numbers do not get recorded at an exchange. It is totally an over, over the counter market. And you, you have to know someone on the inside to get the data. And it's very, and to me, this is the most important risk variable to know because if indeed the, the down payment rises that dramatically, basically you short everything in the house, everything on the board, uh, you short. The riskier, the better, <laughs> you short it. Um, on the other hand, when, and oh, this was, I picked up these numbers and uh, the understanding of this um, uh, uh, last uh, fall. I had uh, Adam Fisher, um, and I, I've done an interview with him on, on my website, uh, and he's the one who explained all this to me. Basically, he's in the market every day. He talks to his, his, his broker at uh, two places. The two places that are doing it are the, 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 the oligarchy of this, of this market is Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and basically finds out what the terms are. He doesn't care who the, who the lender is. He's, as a hedge fund, he's the, he's the borrower. He finds out what the terms are. The interest rate is going to be some nominal interest rate, and the question is, the main question is, how much down? Now, he came out here last uh, spring. No, this, excuse me, last fall. He came out here last fall. And so that would be the, uh, the fall of 09, right? The fall of 08, is when the haircut went up, or namely the, uh, the collateral, excuse me, the down payment went way up. And then in 09, we saw that the, the, the financial markets, fixed income and equity, start to rise, not just here, but across the board, across the world. And, and so it was a year later. It was like in, uh, he was here in about October or, or November of 09, so it's a year later. So I said to him, uh, well, if, if, if the, if the, the down payment w went from zero to 50, uh, what is it today? I said, no, don't tell me. Let me guess. Uh, because remember, those people who were doing the lending also lost out because the securities plummeted in value and they didn't have enough uh, of, of, a, uh, of a cash protection against it. They didn't have enough down payment. Okay? You, you lend 100 against a house, uh, or you lend 90 against a house, you, the, the owner puts up 10, the house falls in half. So basically, the collateral's fallen in half, the, the uh, capital of the uh, borrower's wiped out, so, so you lose money. So basically, uh, here it is a year later, I said, okay, let me guess. <laughs> I thought perhaps the, the haircut had come down to 10 or 15 percent down payment. He said, no, it's back to where it was. <laughs> it's back to zero, essentially zero. So the same people who got wiped out and had to run to the government for TARP money, a year later, realizing the government will bail them out, went and took the same risk again, which I find absolutely startling. This is something called moral hazard. If there's a better example of moral hazard, I've never seen it. Um, when the government bails you out uh, for taking risk, and you know they're going to come back and bail you out again, or you think so anyway, or you pray so, <laughs> then you keep taking the same risk. And it was just at a dream. I, I, I was staggered by it. You know, all I could think of saying is, do they not have short-term memory? <laughs> or or, or did, was everyone in the organization replaced? I'm not sure which. But anyway, the point is we're back to where we were, and, which means the markets are now taking this free money, essentially, or a quarter of a point money with almost infinite leverage, 
and they're spreading it across world markets wherever the security has a higher yield than what they're paying for the money. And as long as the Fed keeps the short-term rates cheap, they're going to have a big margin. So what started to happen is these hedge fund guys start spreading out across the world looking for big spreads that they feel comfortable won't collapse in one day. As I say, they're even into the Greek debt because the Greek debt has about a 10-day window before Germany gives them an answer as to whether or not they're going to have a bailout. So they'll probably go in there for you know, five days or whatever and think they're very conservative. Um, <laughs> they will. <laughs> um, but the, what's, what happened, not only does it pour forth spending in risky markets by people who have a different standard of risk. Their standard of risk is not what we learned in school or what we teach in school or at McCombs is to do some fundamental securities evaluation of does this company have products that will generate revenue? Will the revenue be sufficient to service the obligations? All that fundamental stuff, forget it. What's driving the market is this overnight money. Their standard is different. Will it, will it collapse in a day? They're even willing to buy grease. So <laughs> as long as it's a day. So basically, we're, we're all in the, uh, we, we have a misimpression. Um, here I was trying to uh, do some of these uh, lectures last fall and, and try to puzzle and piece out what the market is thinking on why so much purchasing went into the fixed income market and to the equity market and why those prices rose so dramatically in the face of this bad economic news that I laid out before. And all I could think of is they must you know, think that somehow the Fed, like magic, still has the wand and can make things right. In other words, the V-shaped recovery is what they were calling it. Um, and, but it wasn't that at all. I mean, there were no doubt some people placing bets based on that impression. But the bigger mover of the situation was the fact that the haircut or the, or the um, down payment of your own capital had shrunk again. And they were out everywhere looking for margin spread. Now, where they spread out was not just the U.S. market, and here's the interesting part about it is they spread out to markets across the globe. And they went to the markets that had the highest yield because their yield, what they're, what they're trying to do is borrow money at a quarter of a point and look for the highest yield. And they're living off the spread on a highly leveraged basis. And where they went with it was outside the United States very quickly. In fact, probably first went to the securities of the fixed income of the emerging markets. And there was some good reason for it because the emerging markets were back growing again a lot faster than we were in the United States because they didn't get underwater like our, our, our consumer underwater, our banks are underwater, our institutions were underwater, and our government was underwater. Um, basically, uh, they, they went there first. So what it did was it took, it, 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 what it's known is the U.S. became the funding source of the carry trade. You borrow in dollars and then you purchase securities in another economy with a different currency. So you got to sell your dollars and buy the other currency and then with that buy whatever gives you the biggest spread. So now